that we have uh, room for, for one round uh, of questions from the audience and, um, uh, and we'll answer those uh, all at once. So do we have some questions? Okay, we've got one over here, so let's start there and the rest of you be thinking of your questions. Hi, uh, Charlie Iceland from WRI again. Uh, I, I was really impressed with your, your slide, uh, Christian, uh, on reducing food waste. And, and what we see from uh, studies is, is that a third of all for food produced globally is, is either lost or wasted. And um, what that means is if we didn't waste that 33%, we could actually increase food production by 50% which gets close to that 70% mark that we need to attain. And, and so I'm wondering, uh, maybe for PepsiCo and, and for Coca-Cola, what, what are you doing to, to try to uh, reduce food losses and waste in your agricultural supply chain? Okay, let's take another question before we get into that one. Others? Completely unrelated to that. That's good. Yes, please. Get two. <laughs> there was work done by the uh, International Food Policy Research Institute so, uh, looking at uh, water scarcity relationship with population and economic growth under various business and policy scenarios. One of the findings is that the low carbon economy and the water friendly economy, if you want to put it that way, are not always compatible and you have to make trade-offs. And I'm just curious if you could respond to what do you do when you're faced with an option that uh, might be better for water, but is not the, the lowest carbon impact as compared to another option that has a lower carbon impact, but a higher water impact. Yeah. Okay, and we're time for one more. Anyone else? All right, so we'll leave it at two, and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> Time and uh, silence speaking heavily here. Um, so, uh, panelists, anyone who wants to take those? Okay, so the first question was on food waste and how do we work with our agricultural supply chain to w reduce food waste. Um, we do this in a number of ways. Uh, some of it is working with farmers to... Um, basically to help them really understand what the criteria, quality criteria are in the product that we're looking for so that they get the right, whether it's the sugar content or moisture content or whatever it may be of the product, um, so that then there's less waste that way. We help with storage. We help with um, understanding how to store and how to ship, you know, truck the product to the back of the plant so that when it gets to the back door of the plant, um, the quality has not degraded so that we can use as much of it as possible. Um, we also, um, with implants where we can, you know, there are certain things that, um, you know, like orange peels, um, after we've extracted whatever we can use from the orange peel and the orange, um, gets used for livestock feed. So there's, there's definitely always that attempt to find a, to, to turn a waste into a byproduct and to generate a revenue stream from that waste product. So it's from that byproduct. Um, how do you work when water and uh, carbon emissions are at a bit of a contradiction? Um, I, I guess one of the fundamental challenges of the people who are looking at how you do water footprinting and how you do carbon footprinting is, you know, greenhouse gases are a global thing. So whatever we emit in New York is gonna impact anyone around the globe. Water footprinting, it's, it's very important to look at the availability of water in that part of the footprint that you're looking at. And so, um, you know, I don't know that if this is necessary a corporate policy that we have, but the, the way that I think one would most likely, one of the factors we would take into account is, um, are we working in a water scarce area? And, and how, um, how scarce, how deep an issue is that? And then that can become more of a priority. Good question though. There's a lot of those sorts of nexus issues um, I, I just add to that briefly. Um, we had actually 
a typical discussion uh, around this recently um, when it was sort of we, we had a conversation should we have some sort of target or commitment on uh, recycling water within the plants or reusing water within plants and I said well we had this discussion should we have a global target on this and I said exactly well but there are so many areas where saving that additional marginal water by reusing it is just not going to make sense from a carbon perspective because you would need to treat it with reverse osmosis which needs a lot of energy so therefore that you know carbon carbon uh, household wouldn't work and we had that discussion and at the end of the day we settled onto it has to make sense locally if there is a marginally more important to save that water than uh, than than not emitting the carbon then you have to do it um, on the other side, you know, coal to new technology, let's get this reverse osmosis processes, much less energy intensive would be, would be an obvious one. Um, and on, on, uh, on waste, um, in, the, in the supply chain, I mean, just adding two more examples, it's not that much of a, of a sort of, from a global perspective, mo most of the food waste happens actually on a lot on the consumer side, with the consumer, your milk in the fridge, uh, on very fresh materials. Two things where we can contribute, or we have tried to contribute to that, is um, we, uh, the Bonsucro standard, to which we've been very um, you know, supportive and we've been very much driving, which is about sustainable sugar cane sourcing. Part of that is to get the cane quicker from the field to the crushing, because every hour that it sort of just lies around, it loses as, um, uh, sugar, and therefore the yield goes down. So that's one example. The other example, uh, from Europe actually, where we take um, product um, that is either hasn't been particularly good or byproducts from the from the plant in in Dong and in the Netherlands, um, where we have just just bottled or just spillovers or something, we take this back to our sugar supplier, which is not far away, which actually has a bioethanol plant with its uh, site, and there we put that in and it's getting put into bioethanol. It's a test, it's a pilot. We'll see how that. Does, but at least we don't have to throw it away. Okay, on your question, Ed, uh, in addition to, to what my two colleagues said, the answer is, of course, <coughs> it depends. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, there, there are a number of things you can do is, is, is looking at, one is to look at the entire life cycle of a product, and, and, and actually you may find part of the answer in the life cycle analysis, because at different stages uh, it may look very, very differently. Um, the other thing, which is a challenge, and we've, we've talked about this already earlier, is that carbon has a price, water does not necessarily. And uh, so we have, uh, as some others, uh, started to allocate actually an artificial, a virtual value uh, to water. Water, uh, which allows us to make uh, capex decisions. Then, the only other thing I would add to that is uh, I would certainly agree with what was said here. It depends. It's going to be locally driven, um, but I think your question begs the importance of looking at these issues in an integrated manner, and it, 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 it you know hints at the risk if you try and maximize or optimize for just one objective or one variable, you can end up doing a lot of um, maybe not as bright management decisions that you might otherwise do. Um, so thank you for that question. I'm going to wrap it up here and because uh, I know we want to have a quick uh, conclusion from, from Fred. I want to thank again all my panelists for their time and input. Thank you for your questions and for sticking with us uh, to the end of the day. And I would love to take more, but I encourage you to grab us at the end uh, of the panel or at the end of the session.